Welcome to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, the show that delves into the ups and downs of the stock market, changes in the economy, and news from the worlds of real estate and technology. From breaking news on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or the overseas market, to updates on the bond market, if there's money to be made, we've got you covered. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Virginia Lucci, coming at you live from the home of Biscuits Baseball, Montgomery, Alabama, even though they're not playing because of the pandemic. Today, we'll be covering the word on the street and see what's going on on Wall Street. Next, we're going to check in and see what the new economy looks like. After that, we're going to take a look at what Kodak has been up to these days. And as always, we're going to end the show with my top 10. This time, my top 10 are the highest paid YouTube stars. And just to spoil alert, I'm not on the list yet. Before we begin, I want to give you a disclaimer. I'm not providing legal or financial advice on this podcast. It's for entertainment purposes only. Don't come at me if something we've talked about on the pod doesn't turn out the way we anticipated. The economy is changing every second. As always, if you have any questions, please visit an attorney or financial professional for advice tailored to your needs. Now let's get to it. The NASDAQ Composite posted yet another record Thursday, closing above 11,000. This was an all-time high, as tech stocks came on strong and weekly jobless claims actually came in a little lower than expected. There's also a continued hope for the coronavirus stimulus negotiations, so we all have our fingers crossed. The Dow Jones Industrial Average ended up 180 points, or 0.68%, to 27,387, while the S&P 500 advanced 0.64% to 3,349. Tech giants such as Facebook, Apple, and Google parent company Alphabet were all advancing. Stock closed higher on Wednesday, with the NASDAQ posting another record close. Seven out of the 11 sectors were positive, led by communication services, which gained 2.45%. Now let's get into a little detail. One of the most intriguing stocks to watch today is Bristol-Myers Squibb. Good news started late on Wednesday when reports started circulating that a court had found certain generic projects manufactured by a number of firms had infringed upon patents related to their blood thinner Eliquis. That was especially good news for both Bristol-Myers Squibb and Pfizer, a collaborator that under a 2007 agreement were sharing profits and losses related to the drug on a 60-40 basis. Why is this such a win? Well, Eliquist was the company's best seller prior to the acquisition of Celgene. That title now belongs to RevLimit. So preservation of this drug that rang up $2.6 billion in sales over the past quarter is huge. Of course, the decision will be subject to appeal, but from reading several different sources, it looks that this would push out generic competition for a number of years. And I know that Eloquis is getting pretty pricey for the consumer. My dad that's on Medicare tried to get some Eloquis, and it's gone up to about $300 for a monthly prescription. So, Look out to see what drug prices are doing with this new earnings report. For the firm's second quarter, the firm reported an adjusted 
EPS of $1.63, which is pretty solid. Revenue for the period landed at $10.13 billion, which is also good news and good enough for year-to-year growth of 61.6%. Now, the adjustment to earnings is a bit complicated, but it does make sense, I think. The GAAP EPS printed at negative 0.04, and what does that even mean? Follow me on this. The firm reported a loss of $85 million when, including expenses resulting from purchase price accounting and contingent value fair rights, fair value adjustments. The firm also paid $1.7 billion in taxes on $1.6 billion in pre-tax earnings. This oddity was the result of an internal transfer of certain intangible assets assets as well as the Otesla divestiture. This effective tax rate of more than 100% compares to 19% for the same quarter last year. So that's why things get a little sticky. For the quarter, both RevLimit and Eloquist experienced a 6% growth over last year's comparative period. This is key because sell gene deal is expected to be quite accretive to overall sales performance while greatly enhancing money-saving synergies over a three-year period. And because a number of BMY's other drugs saw year-over-year decline in sales, as the pandemic obviously had a negative impact on patients' non-COVID health care decisions, the firm sees a reason for optimism over the final half of the year. While revenue is now expected to land in the $40.5 billion to $42 billion range, which is a mild increase at the low end, the firm now sees full-year adjusted EPS hitting the tape in between $6.10 and $6.25. That's up from $6 to $6.20. Another stock to watch is Rocket Companies. Rocket Companies is the parent company of Quicken Loans and Rocket Mortgage. On Wednesday, it priced its initial public offering at $18 a share, below its previously planned range. That was a change from the company's plan to issue 150 million shares at $20 to $22 each, according to the Wall Street Journal. But this price didn't last long. The company raised about $1.8 billion in its IPO, less than the $33.3 billion it had expected to raise. But like a rocket, the price of the stock rose as much as 26% to $22.76 per share. According to its IPO perspectives, there's good reason to feel bullish. Rocket companies serve clients in all 50 states and originated over $145 billion in residential mortgage loans in 2019. In the quarter ended March 31 alone, it originated $51.7 billion. Rocket said last month it expected a second quarter profit of more than $3 billion. This compares to a loss in the previous year. The mortgage market shift is benefiting Quicken Loans because Quicken's rise underscores a shift in the mortgage market. Banks have taken a step away from originating mortgages and servicing them following the financial crisis. This left an open opportunity for Quicken to step in. A record 59% of U.S. mortgages were issued by non-banks last year, according to Inside Mortgage Finance. Quicken was also the largest mortgage lender during the first six months of 2020. Underwriters for the offering include Goldman Sachs, Credit Suisse, J.P. Morgan, RBC Capital Markets, and Morgan Stanley. The deal bolsters bolsters the case for a recovery of the U.S. market. Even though the price cut really damaged the thesis a little bit, but the IPO space was hit after the coronavirus pandemic led to a stock market crash. This shut down the IPO market for about two months. So a little bit on the company, billionaire Dan Gilbert founded Quicken Loans in 1985, and it was originally known as Rock Financial. This meant it shared a brand with the tycoon's Rock Ventures firm, 
which has interest in financial services, gaming, and real estate. Rock Ventures is also famous for its sports holding, which include the NBA team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and on the American Hockey League side, the Cleveland Monsters. But really, nothing is outperforming gold. Gold is absolutely king. It has gained nearly 33% so far this year amid the pandemic, surpassed $2,000 per ounce on Wednesday, which is a record high. Meanwhile, the U.S. dollar extended its slump against a number of its global peers. The yellow metal is considered by traders, investors, and experts to be a safe haven asset, meaning it's a good option for investments during any sort of market turmoil. The move in gold prices has Fed rallies in popular commodities-backed ETFs such as SPDR gold shares up 33% year-to-date and iShares Silver Trust up 47% year-to-date. Interestingly, the broader stock market continues to rally even as gold prices hint more caution by investors may be warranted. As previously mentioned, the NASDAQ stock eclipsed 11,000 mark on Tuesday, powered by gains in already pricey stocks such as Microsoft and Apple. Gold's hitting new highs, and treasuries up until this morning were hitting new lows. That tells me the market is not fully convinced in this liquidity-driven rally, cautioned Comerica's Asset Management Chief Investment Officer John Lynch. Silver futures also hit a high of $28.59 per ounce, which is its highest level since March of 2013. In other news, jobless numbers this week have remained steady at 1.18 million, which is actually better than expected. This is the lowest level since the pandemic began. Economists polled by FactSet had been expecting a $1.3 million claims up to last Saturday. Falling unemployment insurance claims is a positive sign the recovery is progressing cautiously, But let's not lose sight of the fact that this is a huge number and unemployment benefits represent a vital life preserver for tens of millions of Americans during a health and economic crisis. A stalled recovery could have a prolonged impact on how quickly the economy can recover long term. On Wednesday, ADP reported that private payrolls grew by 167,000 last month, below fact sheets estimate of 1.34 million. Yikes. It was also down from the revised 4.3 million positions created in June through the June, though the June number was revised higher from an originally reported 2.3 million million gain. The Labor Department will release its broadest picture of July unemployment on Friday in the monthly jobs report. Economists surveyed by FactSet are forecasting that 1.5 million jobs were added last month and that the unemployment rate fell to 10.6% from 11.1% in June. So that brings me to my next point, our second stimulus, or lack thereof. After days of meetings without much progress, Democratic and White House negotiators on Tuesday agreed that they'll aim for a deal on the next stimulus bill by Friday, so Congress can vote next week, although the senators are currently scheduled to leave for their August recess on Friday as well. According to the Washington Post, it looks like that deal would include an agreement on supplemental federal unemployment benefits, that extra $600 check per week that is now expired, and eviction protections for certain renters, the Post said, with two big concessions from the White House negotiating team. Politico reports that White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin have offered a $400 per week unemployment supplement rather than the 70% wage replacement program previously floated by the GOP. Republicans are prepared to concede on giving another $200 billion to state and local aid, according to Political. Though Democrats told 
Politico, the GOP only offered $150 billion. The GOP originally wanted no new aid for states, and Democrats want another $1 trillion. Another sign of progress is that Senate Majority Mitch McConnell, who has been conspicuously absent from the negotiating table amid deep divisions within the GOP, said Tuesday that he is prepared to support a stimulus package that includes the extension of those $600 a week checks if the White House supports it too. That would be an even bigger concessions for Republicans who have thus far been unwilling to extend the benefits at such a level. Democrats have made concessions too, according to Politico. Among them, they're willing to reduce their request for more funding for the Postal Service. There are major hurdles remaining, however, which have been exacerbated by infighting among Republicans. Those divisions are likely to give the Democrats an edge at the negotiating table. The president has promised to get involved if negotiations continue to stall. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows on, told CNN on Wednesday that President Donald Trump would adjust unemployment insurance and an eviction moratorium by executive action. It is unclear if Trump has the authority to do so. Pelosi, Meadows, Senate Majority, I'm sorry, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin plan to meet again at 5 p.m. on Thursday, according to NBC News. Hopefully by the time you are listening to this podcast, you'll already know what happened. But in case you didn't, I wanted to give you the information that we have right now. So I'm going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to start talking about what shape the new economy is taken. And I will give you a hint. It's everything is going to be on your screen. Oh, and if you listen to the end of the show, I'm going to give you my top 10 highest paid YouTubers. It is a wild ride. Are you a business owner? Someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings-on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. Welcome back to the GSMC Financial News Podcast. I'm your host, Virginia Lucci. In our last segment, we talked a little bit about the economic recovery and the future of a stimulus bill. I'd like to take this opportunity to take a little bit of a deeper look into how the economy is really shaping up in the pandemic or post-pandemic world. Things have changed. Um, we don't interact the same way we did six months ago. And there's going to be some real big stars and there are going to be some established businesses that we're unfortunately going to lose. So I want to take a moment to really look at one of the stars of the pandemic and that's telemedicine. Now, Back when the lockdown first began, I was down and out with some spring allergies. I had a slight fever and a pretty nasty cough. One Saturday morning, my imagination got the better of me, and I didn't want to risk the exposure of going to an urgent care. Instead, I contacted a teledoc. The doctor contacted me really quickly. I didn't have to wait very long at all to speak with somebody. Um, we went over my symptoms 
and he reassured me that I didn't have COVID um, and gave me some decongestants. And that, to me, was well worth a $40 copay. So fast forward to, to today, and Teladoc is really revolutionizing medicine. Because of the pandemic, Teladoc Health has become a stock to really watch. Wednesday morning, Teladoc announced that the company will acquire Living Go Health. Teladoc is paying $11.33 for each Living Go share and exchanging 0.592 shares of Teladoc for each share of Living Go, which amounts to 58 to 42 split in terms of control. The purchase price comes out to $18.5 billion and makes the deal the third largest acquisition of a U.S. company this year, behind 7-Eleven's purchase of Speedway gas stations and analog devices acquisition of Maxim Integration. Those are both $21 million deals. So Teladoc becomes a major player acquiring Living Go, which was a telemedicine business focused on patients suffering from high blood pressure and diabetes. Company managers in June noted that total virtual visits rose to 2.8 million during the second qu quarter, which is a three-fold increase over the same quarter a year ago. Sales surged 85% year over year, and managers' forecast revenues will rise between 30% to 40% in 2021. Coming into 2020, Teladoc and Livingo were worth a combined $8.5 billion. Now they're joining forces in one of the biggest de deals of the year, and Living Go is the perfect addition to grow the company even faster. Living Go uses remote sensors, networks, and data to help people manage their weight, diabetes, hypertensions, and behavioral health. They're backed up by a personal 24-7 live coach. Living Go began by developing a remote glucose monitor. The smartphone size device accepts blood sample test strips and automatically sends the information via Wi-Fi to the patient's private account at Living Go. From that point, it's all software. The data is analyzed and sorted. And if anything is out of the ordinary, a private coach will call immediately to set the patient on the right course. Membership has grown to 328,000 members with participation from the four, four of the seven largest health plans in the United States. And managers are working through the details of a federal contract, possibly worth 5.3 million members. Those government contracts are really important. The Trump administration announced Monday a plan to bring telemedicine to Medicare patients in rural communities. There's bipartisan support to advance remote medicine for people living in urban and suburban communities. To me, that's a no-brainer. If my I don't want to say elderly, I'll say older, parents don't have to leave their house and risk exposure, even if it wasn't, there wasn't a pandemic going on, I'd really appreciate that peace of mind. So it, it seems like a natural course of our online life. A government program like Medicare is a logical candidate for telemedicine. It would provide patients with better service and it would save billions in emergency room visits. There are 1.25 billion ambulatory visits each year. If patients could get this on their own without leaving their house, it's going to really save a Medicare system that's already stretched pretty thin. Jason Gorvik, Teledoc's chief executive officer, estimates that 25% could be covered by telemedicine. Getting more federal money will supercharge Teladoc's already potent business model. Teladoc offers a scalable, fast-growing virtual healthcare platform with access to multi-specialty physician networks from general and mental health to dermatology. For 70 global insurers, 300 hospital systems, and 40% of the S&P 500 companies, the platform is critical to providing efficient and cost-effective healthcare. According to a March investor presentation, sales have grown at a 55% compound average growth since 2015. During that time, revenues jumped from only $77 million to $553 million in 2019. For the current year, 
the firm is projecting sales of $703 million as Teladoc Care providers oversee 5.7 million patient visits. And, and that's just the pre-COVID numbers. I expect them to be much higher now. Many of these visits are referrals from healthcare system providers like United Health Group, Primera Blue Cross, or large enterprises like 3M, T-Mobile, and Home Depot. It's really a win-win for businesses. Employees won't have to take a half a day or a day to go to an appointment, and they'll be ready to go back to work sooner because they'll be able to see a doctor on their own time. Additionally, these businesses are using Teladoc's scale advantage to deliver up to 35% savings over in-person visits. The greater number of visits, the more savings derive. Teladoc shares are down sharply following the Living Go acquisition news. The stock may need to digest some of its recent gains. Shares are still up 156% in 2020. Personally, I think that the business is stronger with Living Go, but... We'll see how that turns out. If telemedicine and virtual meetings are up, retail is down. Last time, I mentioned that my favorite department store, Lord & Taylor, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Taylor Brands, a parent company of Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Banks, followed suit, unable to make ends meet during the pandemic. The company recently announced it would lay off 20% of its corporate workers, and close as many as 500 stores to cut costs. The companies join such closed sellers as J. Crew, Neiman Marcus, J.C. Penney, and Brooks Brothers in bankruptcy court. Apparel sales have nosedived during the pandemics as millions of workers lost their jobs or shifted to working from home, while social gatherings such as weddings or parties were canceled or reimagined through digital platforms like Zoom in the name of social distancing. Honestly, I'm wearing a t-shirt and shorts right now while I'm recording this, whereas before the pandemic, I'd be wearing something that was more business casual. So I can absolutely see why these retailers are losing customers. The global pandemic, combined with a very difficult economy, has exacerbated what was already been a difficult time for mall-based apparel retailers, according to David Silverman, an analyst for Fitch Ratings. For a lot of these companies, the pandemic was the final straw. Lord & Taylor has about 40 stores nationwide, many of them in shopping malls. Its filing comes weeks after two other chains, Neiman Marcus and JCPenney, filed for Chapter 11. Um, The pandemic has really hurt struggling retailers, and more than 1 million million workers have been sent home since mid-March. In recent years, Lauren Taylor struggled to keep up with the growing competition from online luxury retailers and lower-priced rivals. Many of its stores, which were located in shopping malls, languished as well-heeled Americans shifted their buying to boutiques and e-commerce brands. In 2017, as I said last time, Lauren Taylor sold its flagship store in New York on 4th and 5th Avenue. Um, to WeWork and began shutting down about a dozen underperforming to- stores. The tote had hoped to revive the f- fledgling, fledgling company by adding makeup scrip- subscriptions, try on boutiques, and other services aimed at busy millennials. But then the pandemic hit, putting the brakes on its plans and forcing it to reconsider its future consum- as consumer spending plummeted. Spending plummeted in just about every category, including apparel, jewelry, and home goods. It was a very similar story at Tailored Brands, where executives said the pandemic left them with little choice but to file for bankruptcy. The Fremont, California-based retailer, which also owns K&G and Moore's, said it had slowed at its 1,400 stores as demand dried up for suits, button-downs, and slacks. Brands that sell clothes targeted at office workers had a particularly hard time. Brooks Brothers and parent company of Ann Taylor are also among those that have filed for bankruptcy. Uh, All in all, 10 retailers have filed bankruptcy within the last five weeks. As of July 23rd, roughly 40 retailers, 
including big and small companies, have filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcies so far this year. That exceeds the number of retail bankruptcies for all of the last year. About two dozen of them have sought bankruptcy protection since the pandemic started. Others include J. Crew, J.C. Penney, Neiman Marcus, Stage Stores, and a center retail group, which owns Lane Bryant, in addition to Ann Taylor. With the U.S. seeing a resurgence of COVID-19, COVID retailers are now flying blind into the year's most vital shopping months. Companies have to struggle decisions on cost-cutting, store closures, and merchandise without having a real clear picture of where consumer demand will be or how bad the economy, the economic conditions will get. Black Friday may be canceled for Cyber Monday. As many as 25,000 stores are expected to close in the U.S. in 2020, mostly in shopping malls, according to CoreSight Research, Research Department. Department stores and fashion boutique are seen as the most in danger. Most of the companies in bankruptcy are trying to survive, but that can ch change if conditions worsen or if lawmakers are unable to reach an agreement on unemployment benefits. CoreSight analyst Deborah Weinswig said in June that she expects to see more retailers go to straight liquidation rather than trying to continue operating by restructuring debt. At the moment, conditions are far from optimal. Demand and store traffic are low and companies are more heavily indebted. If Holiday follows the same course, we're in for a world of trouble, said Siegel. The hope is come the holiday, there will be some sort of return to a better version of normal. But as we know, the coronavirus is taking a shape and a form that nobody has ever expected. So that remains to be seen. The bottom line here is that people are losing jobs at an alarming rate. Department stores and malls are empty as we search for goods online. The future of the U.S. economy is really on your screen, folks. We'll be meeting our coworkers, we'll be seeing doctors, and we'll be shopping from our computers, tablets, and cell phones. Personally, I'm really going to miss the feeling of going into a department store, actually laying eyes on something before I purchase it. Um, really, the, the most difficult thing is buying shoes online because... You really never know how shoes are going to fit your feet and what's going to be comfortable. Um, not to say that I haven't bought shoes online, but it it's just a different feeling. And honestly, I'm going to miss it. So maybe we can salvage some of our retail and small boutiques. So again, I'm telling you folks, shop local. On that note, I am going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I am going to bring news about a Kodak deal with the U.S. government that is, well, let's just say it's interesting. And if you stay to the end of the show, I uh, will talk to you about the top 10 wealthiest YouTubers. So stick around. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back. In our last segment, I talked about how the new economy is shaping up, and it's mostly through our screens. We know that things are changing faster than we could have ever thought. But the most surprising turn of events that I've seen in the last week has been with Kodak. Kodak was big in the camera and film industry, before cell phone cameras, before digital cameras. Kodak was king. My first camera was a Kodak, and I had to use Kodak film to capture my childhood memories. Well, on July 28th, Kodak shocked the world by tweeting, Kodak is proud to be a part in strengthening America's self-sufficiency and producing key pharmaceuticals we need to keep our citizens safe. More to come at the signing ceremony. I'm sorry, what's that? The Eastman Kodak Company is best known as a company that produces camera-related products with historic basis on photography. The company is headquartered in Rochester, New York, and incorporated in New Jersey. Kodak provides packaging, functional printing, graphic communications, and professional, professional services for businesses around the world. Its main business segments are print system, enterprise inkjet systems, micro 3D printing and packaging, software and solutions, and consumer and film. It is best known now for photographic film products. Back in 1888, Kodak was founded by George Eastman and Henry Strong. During most of the 20th century, Kodak held a dominant p- position in photographic film. The company's ubiquity is such that it's a Kodak moment tagline entered common lexicon to describe a personal event that deserved to be recorded for posterity. Kodak began to struggle financially in the 90s as a result of the decline in photographic film and its slowness in moving to digital photography. This is in spite of the fact that they developed the first self-contained digital camera. As a part of a turnaround strategy, Kodak began to focus on digital photography and digital printing and attempted to generate revenues through aggressive patent litigation. However, in January of 2012, Kodak filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Shortly thereafter, Kodak announced that it would stop making digital cameras, pocket video cameras, and digital picture frames and focus on corporate digital imaging market. Digital cameras are still sold under the Kodak brand by JK Imaging Limited under an agreement with Kodak. In August 2012, Kodak announced its intention to sell its photographic film, commercial scanners, and kiosk operation as a measure to emerge from bankruptcy, but not its motion picture operations. In January of 2013, the court approved financing for Kodak to emerge from bankruptcy by mid-2013. Kodak sold many of its patents for approximately $525 billion to a group of companies that include Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung, Adobe Systems, and HTC, under the names Intellectual Ventures and RPX Corporation. On September er, September 3rd of 2013, the company emerged from bankruptcy, having shed its large legacy liabilities, and exited several businesses. Personalized imaging and document imaging are now part of Kodak Alaris, a separate company owned by the UK-based Kodak Pension Plan. So, now they're a pharmaceutical company? That's a weird flex. So, how did this happen? Here we are, a company with no pharmaceutical experience. Yes, they've got experience in making chemicals that had to do with developing film, but no experience with drugs. So... If the Trump administration wanted to say that we're too dependent on getting drug ingredients from China, we want to bring it here, that would make a lot of sense. But we have all sorts of other viable drug companies that could do this. Eastman Kodak is not one of them. So that's what really is strange to me. Last December, the Blackstone Group 
dumped its stake in Kodak, according to SEC filings. At the same time, George Carbuncle, a billionaire investor, and his wife Renee bought more than 4 million shares, or about 15% of the company. And Moses Mark, a billionaire real estate investor, bought 5.6 million shares, or about 13%. This occurred back when COVID was isolated and not a threat to the U.S. The company's chief executive officer and a small set of insiders made hundreds of millions of dollars on paper and possibly in cash in some cases, according to filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission and news reports. So news emerged on July 28th that Kodak had secured a $765 million government loan under the Defense Production Act to undertake the production of ingredients for generic pharmaceuticals, including hydroxychloroquine, a drug that has previously been used to treat malaria and that President Trump has suggested could be effective in treating COVID-19. Shares have given up some of their explosive gains, but following the announcement, the stock is up nearly 500% over the last year. On the surface, the Trump administration found a creative way to help large and struggling U.S. manufacturer hit hard by in the hard city of Rochester, New York, by potentially providing capital to transition into producing chemicals for pharmaceuticals. But the stock surge was based only on a letter of intent, not an actual loan from the new and little-known government agency called the U.S. Developmental Finance Corporation, uh, the U.S. Development Finance Corporation, UFC, was created to provide foreign aid and is run by White House Senior Advisor Jared Kushner's former roommate, Adam Bowler, who doesn't have any concern about the stock's transactions during the deal. DFC spokesperson Laura Allen confirmed this in a response to a series of questions that were sent over email. As a public company... Kodak is subject, subject to securities laws and regulations overseen by the SEC, and we have no reason to believe that they didn't comply with all necessary requirements, according to Ms. Allen. But did they? I already mentioned that Moses Marks scooped up about 15% of the company's shares, Marx is the chairman of the board of the Berkshire Bank in Manhattan, and George Carfunkel is one of the bank's directors, along with Joseph Fink and Philippe Katz, acquired stock in Kodaks with Marx through a set of companies, according to the SEC records and Berkshire's website. Katz and Finks are Marx's son-in-laws, according to a 2013 SEC filing. Carfunkel and Katz have been members of Kodak's board of directors since 2013 and 2019, respectively. So, essentially, what we have here is a small cohort of investors buying up a substantial portion of the $44 million outstanding shares of a company in dire need of a turnaround. At the time, Kodak was trading for about $2.50 per share, which is where it sat 10 days ago. And then the federal government entered the picture. In October of 2018, President Trump signed a reauthorization of laws governing the Federal Aviation Administration that included unrelated set of provisions creating the U.S. DFC. The idea, which had bipartisan support in both houses of Congress, was to help the U.S. compete with China for hearts and minds, by expanding American project financing to developing countries. Bowler, who, again, is Jared Kushner's friend, um, and now he is Kushner's unofficial right hand on the White House Coronavirus Task Force, um, was nominated to head the agency last year and told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that he was dedicated to the foreign policy mission. 
from water fur- purification in India to energy in El Salvador, from a clinic in Cameroon to thousands of loans to women entrepreneurs throughout the world, DFC will work to improve conditions in c- developing countries, according to what Bowler has said. Now, it's been a while since I've been in Rochester, but I can assure you that it was not a developing nation, but it's located somewhere between Albany and Buffalo on I-90. So I'll leave that there. Um, in May, Trump issued an executive order inverting the purpose of the law to allow tiny agency to finance projects in the United States. Bowler advised the White House on how to make sure the executive order's grant of new powers aligned with the agency's core capabilities. The agency had dedicated 14 staff members to domestic projects and is continuing its global mission. Sometime after the order was signed, White House economic and trade advisor Peter Navarro, Bowler, and Kodak executive worked out the blueprint for a deal in which the company would begin to make pharmaceutical chemicals in exchange for a $765 million loan that Allen said would be managed by the Pentagon under the Defense Production Act. The company put out the word of the previously secret agreement in a media advisory on July 27th that was quickly pulled back, but the advance public notice prompted a run on the stock On the same day, the company's CEO, James Contaneza, claimed $1.75 million in stock options, at that time priced between $3.03 and $12 per share, in a previously undisclosed undisclosed agreement with the company's board. A day later, on July 28th, the deal was announced publicly, creating a massive surge in the value of the stock. Contaniza was asked about unusually heavy trading of Kodak stock on July 27th, just before the deal was announced in an interview on CSNBC last week, but not about his own stock. He said, well, I mean, obviously this has been a pretty tight kept secret even until the last day. I couldn't tell you what influenced that the volume or didn't, but we knew for over a week. The share price rose as high as $60 on July 29th before closing the week under $22 per share. By the closing bell on Tuesday, it was under $15 per share. Though the SEC doesn't require all trades to be publicly disclosed, some activity is reported. The Carfunkels donated $3 million of their share, I'm sorry, $3 million of their shares to Congregation Chimas Yizoral, um, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, um, on July 29th, which, depending on the moment of transfer, could have been as wor- worth as much as $180 million. So they acted quick to get that stock off of their hands. That put the Carfunkel under the threshold of ownership, 5%, at which they must report further transactions to the SEC. Likewise, Mark sold about 250,000 shares of his stock in two batches at $18.7 or $18.17 per share and at $40.41 per share for a total of about $9 million on July 29th, putting him under the 5% mark. It's impossible to know from SEC filings whether the Kaufmans and the Mars continue to sell their shares in the company, which they could do legally once their respective stakes dropped under the 5% mark. In an interview with Fox Business last week, Navarro described the deal as fully collateralized, which Laura Allen said would be done through real estate equipment and purchase orders. But it isn't even close to being done. Kodak simply cleared an initial clearance phase and still has to pass more tests to get the loan. These tests will take several months, Allen said, and we hope to complete the process by the end of the year. So, investors made a killing without a dime being spent. Trump hailed it as one of the most important deals in the history of U.S. pharmaceutical industries, 
during remarks to the White House on July 28th. My administration has reached a historic agreement with an American company. You remember this company. It's called, from the good old camera age, the old days, to begin producing its critical pharmaceutical agreement. ingredients. It's called Kodak, Trump said, and it's going to be right here in America. The company never left. It was just sitting there with millions of cheap shares, waiting for some good news. Is this a pump and dump stock scheme? An insider trading deal to rival Martha Stewart? Or a deal that will help the country by producing compound for new medicines? We don't know. Um, we're going to have to wait to see what the SEC shows us. And that could take quite a while. So I'm going to ask you to stay tuned and keep an eye on Kodak for the next couple of weeks. And let's see what happens. So with that, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I am going to talk to you about the big money makers on YouTube. Stick around. Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand. Welcome back. In our last segment, we tried to unwind the Kodak deal with the Trump administration. I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but that remains to be seen. So let's shift a little bit on to something a little bit lighter. Um, in other new episodes, I've talked about TikTok as the teen's latest and greatest social media destination. But there's still a lot going down on YouTube. Humans have evolved to learn visually now more than ever before. In fact, YouTube gets an outstanding 5 billion video watches per day. With that kind of volume, serious YouTubers would have to be crazy not to try and make money off of their passion. YouTube doesn't gain everybody's fortune, but there are tons of successful YouTubers that prove that being a YouTuber can pay off. While most beginners won't be rolling in cash right away, it could be an, a solution to step out of the current 9-to-5 job and pursue something more interesting. Now, you won't be able to quit your desk job anytime soon if your views are low, but for YouTubers getting hundreds of thousands or even millions of views, YouTube can be pretty profitable. So let's take a look. At number 10, we have probably the most controversial entry on this list, Jake Paul. He has 19.7 million subscribers and makes about 100, I'm sorry, 11.5 million. At 23 years old, Paul is a very controversial figure. He's once described as a moronic meth menace to society over his pranks that included angering neighbors by setting fire to furniture in an empty swimming pool. He also made his boxing pro debut earlier this year in Miami. Federal agents, aided by a armed SWAT team, raided Paul's home in Calabasas near Los Angeles on Wednesday, reportedly taking several rifles out of the house as a part of an FBI investigation into a looting spree at an Arizona mall during the George Floyd protests in May. Nobody was taken into custody and no arrests were made. Um, the FBI initially declined to comment on the nature of the investigation, 
with a spokesperson saying in a statement that the affidavit in support of the search warrant has been sealed by a judge and I'm therefore prohibited from commenting as to its nature, the nature of the investigation. Later, the FBI changed their mind and said that it's investigating allegations of criminal acts surrounding the incident at the Scottsdale Fashion Square in May. Paul was in the mall as protest, peaceful protests against the killing of George Floyd by a former police officer led to looting. The U2 star, along with two friends, was arrested for trespassing and charged with criminal misdemeanor. But the city attorney said Wednesday that he had dismissed the charges to allow for the FBI investigation to go ahead. At the time, Paul rejected any allegation that he was involved with the looting. But later he tweeted that we filmed everything we saw in an effort to share our experience and bring more attention to the anger felt in every neighborhood we traveled to. We were strictly documenting, not engaging. Mm, Okay. Police at the time said they had received hundreds of tips and videos identifying Jake Paul as an actual participant in the so-called riot. I guess all those people were mistaken. So since his off-screen behavior has eclipsed whatever he was doing on YouTube, we're going to move on. At number nine, we have a much less controversial pick. He's known for his Let's Play and his Try Not to Laugh videos. Um, At number nine, we have Markiplier. He is known to his family as Mark Edward Fishback. He makes $13 million per year and has 225.7 million followers. Markiplier is primarily known for his playthroughs of indie and horror games, including the Five Night at Freddy series that is very popular in my house, Amnesia, The Dark Descent, and its sequel, Gary's Mod, Happy Wheels, Surgeon Simulator, SCP Containment Breach, and Slender, The Eight Pages, among others. Joining YouTube in March of 2012, Markiplier originally was doing sketch comedy, and later he began streaming his game through or playthroughs of games. Fast forward a couple years, he's also collaborated on a sketch comedy and gaming videos with a number of fellow YouTubers, including Crank Gameplays, Jack Septicai, Lord Minion 777, My Skirm. PewDiePie, Matt Hyas, Game Grumps, Sindago, Yaman Mash, Jax Films, Captain Sparkles, Ego Raptors, and Lixian TV. And I know right now some of you are screaming at your radio saying that I pronounced everything wrong, but just bear with me. Um, celebrities such as Jack Black and Jimmy Kimmel. Um, so he's worked with a lot of folks. He has acting exper- ex- appearances in Tom Ska's ASDF movie series, Smosh the Movie, Disney XD's Gamer's Guide to Pretty Much Everything, YouTube Rewinds 2015 and 2016, and Five Nights at Freddy's The Musical. Markiplier has moved off the platform to join the board of comic book publisher Red Giant Entertainment in November of 2014. In June of that year, at the San Diego Comic-Con, he co-hosted a panel of figures from the company, including CEO Barry Benny Powell and writers David Campidi, Mort Castle, David Lawrence, and Brian Augustin. In 2016, it was announced that he would appear in his own line of comics. Markiplier signed with the William Morris Endeavor in late 2016, having expressed interest in branching out from YouTube content. In 2018, Markiplier announced a launch of a new fashion brand called Cloak in a joint venture with Jack Septicai. In 2012, federal YouTuber and streamer Pokey Main joined Cloak as a partner and creative director. I am personally a fan of his Try Not to Laugh series, but unlike my stepson, I'm not a gamer, so I'm not really into his gameplay videos, but I like him. Probably one of my favorites on this list. At number eight, we have Logan Paul. He's Jake's older brother. 
he has 20.1 million followers and earns 14.5 million per year. Paul gained a following in 2013, posting sketches on the video sharing application Vine. He registered his YouTube channel, The Official Logan Paul, on October 18, 2013, where he started posting regularly following the closure of the Vine app. He later created the Logan Paul Vlogs channel on August 29th of 2015. This has become the most, his most subscribed to YouTube channel. As of January 2020, the t- channel has received over 20 million subscribers and 4.8 billion views, ranking as the 56th subscribed in the United States and placing him among the hun- top 140 channels on the platform. Back in 2017, Logan visited a Japanese forest known for suicides and happened to come across a hanging body. Logan filmed the body and made jokes about it, showing the world his immaturity. He was heavily criticized after that, but somehow he gained even more followers. He confessed that he made a mistake and the world moved on. Today, he's still making videos and other badly humored vlogs. In February of 2019, Logan claimed that he has brain damage which he sustained from football or for playing high school football he claims it affects his ability to have empathy and a human connection with others and i'm gonna leave that right there at number seven we have another gamer van os gaming with evan fong van os has 24 million subscribers earning 15.5 million dollars annually for fong that's not too shabby fong lives in toronto canada where he's not only a youtuber but a video game comment, commenter and a music producer. He produces montage-style videos on YouTube of him and other creators playing various video games. Aside from this, he produces music under the name Rhinox and served as a creative director for video game Dead Realm and as a voice actor for the YouTube premium series Paranormal Action Squad. In January 2015, Fong began to receive mainstream media attention as he approached 11 million subscribers and a ranking within the top 25 most subscribed YouTube ch- channels on YouTube, with commentators identifying him as a central figure in the growing video game commentary subculture. Speaking at the time, he suggested that his success could be credited to the fact that viewers really like the authentic type of content from regular people just playing games. In 2015, he appeared on the YouTube Gaming Evolution panel at PAX East in Boston, Massachusetts, alongside collaborators I Am Wildcat, Louis Calibri, and Minilab. The majority of Vanos gaming videos take the format of a montage or compilation featuring various clips from a particular game session, usually featuring other video game commenters. The Canadian press described a typical Vanos video by claiming that it features Vanos and a group of friends chatting, laughing, and making jokes over game play from popular titles as Grand Theft Auto 5 or Call of Duty World at War. Number six is one of the most recognizable names on the list, PewDiePie, also known as Phoenix Arvid Kelsberg, I think. Again, you're probably screaming at your radio right now that I've pronounced everything wrong, and I apologize, but he has one of the most subscribed YouTube channels on this list, and was the most subscribed YouTube channel in the entire world for five years. Right now, he has 102 million subscribers. That is a lot of people. (laughs) It is mind-blowing to me. He makes 15.5 million per year. In the last couple of years, his income has actually decreased, uh, and his net worth is somewhere between 30 and 50 million dollars. PewDiePie hails from Sweden and currently lives in Brighton, England. The current incarnation of his channel started in 2010. In his early years as a YouTube creator, PewDiePie focused on video game commentaries, most notably of horror and action video games. Some of the earliest videos featured commentaries of mainstream video games, including Minecraft and Call of Duty. Although he is particularly noted for his last Let's Play of Amnesia The Dark Descent and its related mods. Starting on 2nd of September of 2011, He also began posting weekly vlogs under the title of Fridays with PewDiePie. In this cancel culture, 
he survived early rape jokes and disturbing language against women and people of color. Ironically, his latest video is about how he's been canceled because his cringy Spotify playlist was released. And again, I'm just leaving that there. And expanded his content into random musings about whatever is on, is trending. 90 Day Fiance, Dr. Phil, meme reviews, whatever he wants. Early in 2019, PewDiePie moved to DLive with his Let's Play videos and centered around Minecraft. In December of 2019, he announced that he would take a break from YouTube the following year and deleted his Twitter account because of his dissatisfaction with the site. PewDiePie began his hiatus on January 15th of 2020, but returned on February 21st. In May, he signed an exclusive deal to stream on YouTube as the platform was enrolling high-profile streamers to rival competitors like Twitch and Mixer. At the time of signing with YouTube, PewDiePie had amassed over 800,000 followers on DLive, but due to his deal with YouTube not having streamed on it for four months, no one's really quite sure what's going on with DLive. Coming in at number five is Dan TDM. Daniel Robert Middleton has been making play videos of Minecraft for his 21 million followers, earning 16.5 million per year. He's got two channels, Dan D TDM and More TDM. Kids love Dan TDM because he's hilarious and he inspires them to unlock their creative and coding pro prowess through their favorite games. Parents love him because unlike other gamers, Dan TDM makes sure his videos are free of F-bombs or other unseemly language. The best thing about YouTube is that anyone can do it, and that's exactly what I did. He told Today Show back in 2015, 2017, rather. Dan creates his videos from his home studio in North Hampshire, more, Northamptonshire, England. Many of his videos show him playing Minecraft or other games while providing his signature high-energy running commentary, but others are elaborate mini-films involving involving original characters he created, such as Dr. Triasaurus, Grim the Dog, Terrence the Pig, Craig the Mailman, and Denton the Bad Guy. Middleton says he does all of his own recording and editing himself, just like I do. At number four, we have another controversial pick, and that's Jeffree Star. He has 17.1 million subscribers and makes $17 million per year. Well, Jeffrey makes bank on YouTube. He also has many different sources where he earns his income. For example, he's a singer-songwriter, model, and a DJ. But Jeffrey really excels at makeup. His tutorials are fabulous, his brand reviews are frank, and challenge videos are funny. The Jeffrey Star cosmetic line is really taking off. But... Jeffrey has fused with most other makeup YouTubers, including conversation with tattoo artist Kat Von D, who accused Star of drug use, racism, and bullying, Tati Westbrook, who accused Star and Shane Dawson of forcing her to upload a video attacking fellow beauty YouTuber James Charles, Kylie Jenner, whose products were criticized negatively by Star, and maybe justifiably, but that's my opinion. Kim Kardashian, and Jared Blandino, co-founder of Too Faced Cosmetic. Star was accused of racism due to derogatory remarks he made about minorities. He later apologized for these remarks. In June 2020, Star apologized after images and an archive of his former website, Lipstick Nazi, resurfaced. The website featured swastikas alongside photos of Star engaging in self-harm. Yikes. He may be canceled, but he is attempting to stay above the fray. Hmm. In number three is our first pine side YouTuber. Natasha has 44.3 million subscribers and makes 18 million per year, and she is barely in elementary school. Born Anastasia Radsnitskaya in on January 27th, 2014, in Russia, she's also known as Natsdaya, Like Natsdaya, and Stacy. She is a Russian-American YouTuber. 
She was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, and doctors feared she would never speak. But she's proven them all wrong. Her channel was created in January 2016, and it started off as a toy unboxing channel, but has transformed into a channel showcasing visits to amusement parks in at least six countries, day trips to the beach, birthday parties, and Halloween costumes. When I was her age, I was still feeding Cheez-Its to my stuffed Mickey Mouse doll and calling him my husband. So good for her. Good for her. At number two, we have Dude Perfect. Dude Perfect is not only one perfect dude. They're actually a group of five high school friends with the Cotton Twins, Corey and Kobe, as the core of the team. They have 51 million subscribers and make $20 million collectively each year. Dude Perfect focuses mainly on sports and trick plays. They got their fan base for their great sense of humor. They have other sources of income, such as their mobile app called Do Perfect, and pretty much all their YouTube videos are sponsored. However, they still make most of their money off of YouTube ads. Additionally, the group received professional endorsements and requests, which began with the then Sacramento Kings player Tyreek Evans in an, inter in an effort to promote Evans' run for Rookie of the Year. Dude Perfect also appeared on Season 6 of Rob Durdeck's Fantasy Factory. Dude Perfect also worked with Green Bay Packers' Aaron Rodgers, NBA star Chris Paul, Australian 10-pin bowler Jason Belmonte, actor Paul Rudd, singer Ted McGraw, Seattle Seahawks coach Pete Carroll, and quarterback Russell Wilson. Heisman Trophy winner and former quarterback Johnny Manziel at Kyle Field, Tennessee Titans quarterback Ryan Tannehill, the U.S. Olympic team, NASCAR drivers Ricky Stenhouse Jr., Travis Pastrana, James Boucher, and IndyCar Series driver James Hinchcliffe at Texas Motor Speedway, NASCAR driver Dale Earnhardt Jr., Cleveland Browns wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr., New Orleans States quarterback Drew Brees and coach Sean Payton, the Seattle Seahawks, and St. Louis Rams players Greg Zularen, Johnny Hecker, Jacob McQuaid, tennis player Serena Williams, and country singer Luke Bryan. I'm exhausted just reading those names off, so I think the boys are doing well. The team traveled to the United Kingdom to film a video with players of Manchester City FC, Arsen FC Arsenal FC, and Chelsea FC. Wow. That is a lot. At number one, um, we have the number one highest paid YouTuber is eight years old. You heard me right. Eight years old. Ryan Kaji is an eight year old with one of the most popular YouTube channels in the world. Ryan's World has 23.3 million followers and makes a whopping $26 million per year. He started by making videos purely of himself, opening toys and playing with them. While this sounds rather hard to watch, he managed to gain millions of views on each of his videos. The videos where he opens giant eggs filled with unknown varieties of toys from brands like Ten Transformers and Minions are among his most popular. His video of opening a cars themed egg has over a billion views. And he so thoroughly conquered the surprise toy egg space that major retailer actually sell Ryan's World branded eggs. His videos have an impact, a huge impact on the toy industry, and advertisers for toy companies are willing to splurge on this young YouTuber. Ryan now creates animation videos for kids that should keep his subscribers and income rolling for a few more years. And I'm going to apologize if you heard my dog play with her pigs in a blanket toy. Um, and that was just amusing when I started talking about Ryan. So my takeaway from this is that YouTube stardom is really random. People will watch you do the most mundane things from playing video games to opening boxes or even just putting makeup on. Maybe I should change the way the GSMC Financial News YouTube videos work and um, show you what pe show you people what it looks like when I'm doing research for the pod. Come at me if you like this idea, or don't. It's probably not a good idea. 
With that, thank you for joining me for the GSMC Financial News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Join me next time for the world on the street as the economy continues to throw us for curveballs. Find us on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the show. If you get a chance, write us a nice review because that's going to help us. Also, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. See ya and wear a mask. You've been listening to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's podcast.